The first speaker that we're going to have is Ricardo Salvador. He's going to be speaking on the general overarching plantation economic scheme that controls the food system today. Ricardo is a senior scientist and director of the Food and Environment Program for the Union of Concerned Scientists. Ricardo works with citizen scientists and economic economists, as well as politicians, in order to transition our current food system into one that grows healthy foods while employing sustainable and socially equitable practices. Dr. Monica Gisalfi, Monica, I apologize if I did not get your last name right. You can correct me when you speak. She is an associate professor of history at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. She has a couple books out. One's The Takeover, Chicken Farming and the Roots of American Agribusiness from 1914 to 2007. And also her other, another book she has is From Cropling to Contract Farming, The Roots of Agribusiness in the American South, looking at 2000, or 1929 to 1939. She's gonna help us connect some of the dots, how we got from there to the issues that are starting to arise here in this extreme form of, of vertical integration, which I will just say in Nebraska, um, we are getting bombarded with at this time. Um, but these, her current book, it basically tells the story of the long, long civil rights movement, specifically the plight of the African-American farmers in the American South as they fought for economic justice. Our third speaker, um, John Boyd Jr. He's a fourth generation black farmer, businessman and civil rights activist. He's all over the place these days. You don't have to look very far to find him. Uh, John's gonna talk a little bit about his real life experiences and dealing with some of these predatory practices within the system. And he represents as founder and president of the nonprofit Na National Black Farmers Association. And that's a position that he's frequently placed him in the national spotlight, as I mentioned. Um, he's been involved with politics as well as farming. And he rode his tractor in 2010 to Washington, D.C. to plead for settlement funds in a long running lawsuit against the federal gov government for historical discrimination against black farmers. We welcome you all. But just before we turn the mic over to Ricardo, I want to also offer a special guest. Um, for us, for this group, she is going to give a blessing. I believe she is with us. Um, she was having some trouble getting on. If she's not, I can say a few words, but we thought it'd be most appropriate coming from Jolene Whiteclay. Jolene is a second generation Crow farmer on the Crow Indian Reservation. Excuse me, not a farmer. I won't get myself in trouble here, a rancher. And their family's been ranching for, for, this is the second generation they've been ranching here. It's been about 75 years um, that they have uh, brought back some of um, indigenous farming back to their reservation. This is very rare. This is something that I think in the next discussion, which we'll look which at we'll pathways pathway. for young diverse people, will become um, a more integral piece of the conversation of why this is rare um, and how we are able to create pathways for young people back onto the land. Um, Jolene, are you with us? Uh, she is. She just needs to un uh, unmute her mic. Maybe I can do that here. Thank you, Rob. Jolene will give us a blessing to help set this conversation, this important conversation, in the right direction. And and as we get moving forward, we just want um, everyone to. Uh, understand and know that there are a lot of different people from a lot of different spaces that represent a lot of different areas on this call as there has been in the prior calls. This is, an intent, this is intended. We want to have diverse backgrounds to be able to understand how we best meet these regenerative solutions. So with that, respect everybody on this call. We are unified, we are a team on this, and together, only together, will we be able to find out the best pathway forward for everyone. Uh, Jolene, are you ready? Can can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, hello. Yes, yes we, we can. Hear you. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Like um, I was introduced, I am a Crow Indian from the Crow Indian Reservation in Montana, and I am like the third generation. And I am presently teaching my fourth generation, which is uh, my son, my sons, and um, 
we'll leave it right there. I want to, first of all, say a prayer for the group. And um, as I said before, I am very glad that this group, group got together. And I'm thankful because water and food sustain life for each one of us. Without it, we would have a very hard time living. And so as you put your focus on that, I want to pray to the Lord. Lord, I ask you right now that you bless this group because they are doing something for your people. Water and food sustain life. And these people have taken their time in their life to be able to do something good for the environment, for their own people, for the youth, for the future generations. If we didn't do that now, Lord, we wouldn't have anything in the future to look forward to. But as the American Indians did in years past, they always gave all their issues unto you, Lord, and they asked you to help. And that's what we're doing right now. There is nothing impossible with you, Lord. So bless this meeting and bless all those people. Provide them the knowledge and provide them what they need to be able to be successful in what they are attempting to do right now. It's not easy to be a farmer or a rancher. You have to go out in all different kinds of weather, weather you have no control of. And right now, they are trying to do something about it. In Jesus' mighty name, thank you. Thank you, Jolene. Thank you for starting off our conversation with this important blessing. <clears throat> Well, with that, um, as we learned in the national security conversation, there's a lot of different folks from a lot of different areas that are feeling uh, the predatory approach of the current system. So uh, this special event brought to you by PrEP and organized by GC Resolve is now in the hands of the people. Uh, Ricardo Salvador, um, I'm really privileged and honored to be able to have you lead us off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham, and the privilege is all mine. Thank you very much, Jolene, for that introduction. And I appreciate being on the slate with two heroes of mine, and so I consider my job to essentially get done with my piece as soon as possible so we can all listen and hear, learn from them. It is very appropriate that the main office of the United States Department of Agriculture is named for a flagrant racist. Jimmy Whitten, prominent racist, served in Congress from 1941 to 1995, representing the state of Mississippi. It's very appropriate that that building is named after such a prominent racist because of the fact that though the USDA by itself does not represent all of the ways that the agricultural system functions in the United States, it very much is an institutionalized version of officialdom in agriculture. And it is not accidentally racist. It is inherently, structurally, intentionally racist. And this is what we're here to talk about today. And I want to give a little bit of an insight into the role of this department and its inception. So all of you on a call like this would be attracted to this topic because you're already experts. And I expect that I'm probably going to be repeating many facts that you're quite familiar with and just providing a broad overview to understand the inherent structural racism of the agricultural system. I wanna begin by quoting to you some words from Jamie Whitten himself. The man's power derived not only because of the fact that during the time that he served in Congress representing the state of Mississippi, he was chair of the Appropriations Committee, a very powerful committee on Congress because it distributes dollars. Uh, he was one of the main exponents of uh, pork barrel politics. 
And uh, he gave a speech in a very critical year, the year 1965, just a few months before the passage of the Civil Rights Act, where he manifested exactly how he regarded the Civil Rights Act and what it meant for the interests of white people in the United States. So I'm going to quote you just a couple of passages from that speech. I delivered that speech to the Delta Council. It was the 30th annual meeting of that council, all white set of business interests. And what he said to them was that they needed to protect their way of life. You know the dog whistle that that represents. He proclaimed to them that in his opinion, opinion the struggle to grant rights to black voters was actually nothing of the kind, that it was actually a massive front. That what it actually represented, and here I quote directly, it is a front for a takeover by militant, militant agitators to obtain power, to control industry, agriculture, and even labor. So you can see the threat that Whitten represented to his fellow uh, business constituents, that the right of black people to vote represented to his quote, way of life. He furthermore, just so that we're not confused about what he meant, said that if the Voting Rights Act, that it would be a downhill road to integration, to amalgamation, and to ruin. Now, just to be fair to the man, before he died in 1995, this is the only reason he stopped serving, he died in office. Um, he recanted some of the most vile racist beliefs that he proclaimed. But he did his damage in 1965, and that's actually what I'm referring to right now. He was a staunch opponent of the Civil Rights Act and remained so for many years after that. So you can see that what he was expressing in the speech that I quoted to you was that there was a threat to the exclusive rights of one subset of the population of the United States. And I actually, the passages that I quoted to you, to our great detriment, could be quite contemporary. There's probably utterances like that in country clubs across the nation right now, particularly triggered because of the decision that the election is going to represent for those very same interests. In some cases, the descendants of those very same people. So let me be clear about what this is by backing out and, and pardon me for patronizing you, but just to make sure that we all understand um, or have the same interpretation of words, I'm going to talk to you about the concept of plantation economics. So even though the practice has uh, been around for a very long time, the model for what today we call plantation economics was something that was perfected in the South of the United States, uh, even preceding the actual formal declaration of independence of this nation. During the time that this was a colony, the plantation economy essentially was permitted by the scale of land available to colonists in the American continent, something that to them had been basically unknown uh, in Europe. They were able to plant at massive scale and then to extract. So they weren't investing in producing wealth that then would be reinvested where the growth was taking place. This was expressly an economic activity that extracted wealth and exported it into what was the growing mercantile network around the planet during the colonial period. So it was large scale, it was extractive, it was labor intensive, and for this reason, they abducted, brutalized, exploited a population that eventually grew to be 12 million people brought over from the American continent, from the African continent, and distributed throughout the entire American continent. The reason there are African Americans throughout the entire continent, remember the name of the continent is America, so there are African Americans throughout the entire continent, the majority not in the United States, the reason they are here to begin with was because of plantation economics. The owners of the plantation were not going to perform their brutal labor for themselves, so they imported labor in order to do that. And without that labor, they would not have been able to build their wealth. And they systematically excluded the laborers who created their wealth from participating in the benefits of that wealth. Not just during the period of slavery. After slavery, the descendants of those people face exactly that same uh, behavior for exactly the same rationale. The system was created by white colonialists for their economic benefit and anybody else on this continent, the Native Americans whose lands were appropriated, the 
Africans who were imported to perform the brutal menial labor, they were inputs, they were tools. They were not regarded as people, they were otherized specifically. If you at the same time hold the creed that all men are created equal, uh, and then rationalize that you're able to exploit other people and brutalize them, you have to have mental software that justifies why you can do that. And the mental software of the time was, these are not people, they're not equal to us. So to this day, we're leaving, living with the consequences of the impression the food system and this nation were created by some people for themselves and everybody else is here just to serve them. That's the reality that was created during the colonial period and we're living with the reverberations of that. Now, let's get back to the United States Department of Agriculture. It was established, as you know, in 1862 by Abraham Lincoln. This is a signal year for a number of different reasons. Lincoln had a lot to do uh, during the first year when he came into office. It was very clear that there was going to be civil war. The war actually had started by the time that he established both the Department of Agriculture, uh, signed, for instance, the Transcontinental uh, Railroad Act, uh, signed the Morrill Land Grant Act that established today's uh, agricultural research uh, universities, uh, created the National Academy of Sciences, and so on. He had a, an agenda that he developed. My personal belief is all the time uh, when he was behind a plow working on a uh, Kentucky farm and subsequently an Illinois farm. So he had a plan that he wanted to follow. Um, in 1859, as he was beginning his campaign for president, he delivered a stump speech, which you can find online, titled something like Lincoln's Address at the Wisconsin State Fair. It is a particularly insightful uh, document revealing the thinking of uh, individuals at that period of time, and for a number of different reasons, but I wanna refer you to a particular passage where he goes deeply into understanding how wealth is built. This was a very timely topic at a time where that was still the frontier of economic thinking. Uh, so compare 1776, not for the reason that you're imagining, but because that was the year that Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations, to uh, 1859, when Lincoln is still riffing off of some of the ideas in that book. And specifically what he was riffing on was the controversy at the time of whether labor was actually the source of wealth or whether you needed to have capital in order to be able to employ labor. Uh, today that is resolved in terms of saying there are factors of production and land and labor required in order to be able to generate capital to begin with. But at the time there was debate about this. I'm gonna quote you a particular line from this speech of Lincoln's. I'm quoting this so that we all understand what we just took for granted as air that we breathe in 1859. He says, a few men own capital and that few avoid labor themselves. If you have capital, why are you working? And with their capital, they hire or buy another few to labor for them. It was an entirely acceptable practice at the time, even in the North, for people to accept that if you had capital, you could buy other human beings to perform your labor for you. Remember, this is not hiring them. He already distinguished you could hire or buy human beings as if they were products. And that thinking of human beings as inputs to generate wealth for others is an inherent part of agriculture to this day. You can hear it when white farmers and ranchers talk about their labor problem. You can hear it when the Secretary of Agriculture talks about who he wants to thank for keeping us all fed during the pandemic. He starts by listing farmers and all of the businesses that provide inputs to farmers. Labors are nowhere in his mental map of how we actually feed ourselves. But if you buy any of the picture that I'm drawing for you without the land that was appropriated from the original inhabitants of this continent, without the labor of the generations of African Americans who created the wealth on which the industrial economy was built in the United States, without the present labor of primarily immigrants and other immigrant, uh, people of color that actually harvest the food, process it, pack it, disassemble the meat, push it onto the grocery shelves, then none of us are eating. So it's not an argument for the preeminence of labor over capital or some kind of people over other kind of people. The other kind of people argument is old, worn and tired. Anthropologists don't accept it. We simply otherize other people when it's convenient to establish that we are special, that we are entitled to certain privileges and others are not. Without all of us working together, the present system would not have come into being. 
If we had been working together, we would not have created a system where some of us would be exploited for the benefit of others. That's the project of people on this call, to undo that reality. So I want to restate uh, my summary uh, in a setting to hear from uh, Monica and uh, John about some of the present consequences of the way that the agricultural system was established. It was established by colonists for their benefit. To this day, we suffer from the consequences of being seen, if we're people of color, of being seen as basically the inputs for that system, the labor provided for that system. The language with which the USDA still refers to us reflects that. So they basically tolerate us, you know, so they're the point of reference and they put up with the rest of us. That's what the word tolerance means. They refer to us with euphemisms that otherize us. They say that we are the underserved. They say that, um, we are the marginalized folks. Uh, well, one of the things that I would respond to an analysis like that is the first thing that I uh, mentioned in this list, which is that without us, the system would not be feasible. So to talk about us as being people that need to be tolerated or that are underserved is not to be realistic about the critical role that we all play in order for the system to come into existence. So uh, I hope that this is a useful frame or analysis for us to hear now about some of the consequences of that mentality. Um, I'm a fan and have learned a great deal from the work that uh, Monica has done in understanding how consolidation uh, has occurred in the agricultural system. And all of you know that John himself has been a primary actor. Uh, he's not gonna tell us about this history. He's gonna tell us about his lived experience in supporting the Pickford uh, suits and many other initiatives that he's led with the uh, uh, Black Farmer Association. So uh, with a great deal of humidity and humility, I, I want to listen to them and learn from them. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. <clears throat> Monica? Um, so thank you so much to Rob and Laura and Graham for inviting me to participate. And it's an honor to sit on a panel with, um, with John and Ricardo. So what I'm doing today is I'm explaining how my research helps us understand the rise of agribusiness. Uh, Graham made reference to my book, The Takeover, which looks at chicken farming and the roots of American agribusiness. And it explores how the poultry industry came into being. My main intervention is the argument that uh, vertically integrated, the vertically integrated poultry industry grew out of the post-Civil War crop lean system in the American South. And so here's one way of thinking about it. In the mid 1950s, one agricultural economist wrote that cotton sharecroppers had become chicken sharecroppers. And this is a useful way of thinking about and imagining the transformation that I'm talking about today. My research examines the growth of the poultry industry in upcountry Georgia. To, so to think about for a moment time and place, I'm looking at um, upcountry Georgia, which is about 60 miles north of Atlanta, between about 1930 and 1960. And so this really intense revolution takes place in the course of 30 years where these cotton sharecroppers become chicken sharecroppers. Um, this region became home to the quintessential agribusiness commonly understood as capital intensive, vertically integrated industrial agriculture that resulted in a class structure that recapitulated the labor exploitation of an earlier era. So again, I, I sort of continue to go back to this idea of thinking about cotton farmers becoming ch chicken sharecroppers. Incidentally, my research is a useful starting point for thinking about Costco's move into poultry production in Nebraska. So where does the story begin or the, the story that I tell? It begins before the Great Depression when animal feed merchants in upcountry Georgia with the backing of national feed manufacturers adopted adapted the crop lean system uh, to the production of chicken farming. Government subsidies, which are really a key part of this story, played a crucial role in driving the growth of the industry, often if not always to the detriment of small farmers. 
Farmers from the 1950s onward acquiesced to industry demands, assuming sizable debt to provide more than half of the capital to run what was becoming a multi-billion dollar industry. So again, to highlight some of the things that I think are important, that's one key thing moving forward. By about 1967, um, poultry farmers are providing more than half of the capital that goes into this functioning poultry industry. Over time, this wildly successful business model, successful for poultry integrators like Purdue, like T Tyson, like Smithfield, known as quasi-vertical integration, became a blueprint that shaped the rise of modern agribusiness, both nationally and internationally. So it's interesting to think that this, this business model is then exported abroad. What's important to note, and this very much relates to Ricardo and, and John, um, my research is primarily, if not wholly, the story of white businessmen, white bureaucrats, and white farmers who built this industry. Integrators, um, and again, when I'm talking about integrators, I'm talking about companies like Tyson and Purdue and Smithfield. Integrators and the federal government actively and intentionally pushed African Americans and women's to the margins of this system. Yielding to pressure from integrators, women, white women ceased raising seasonal flocks. And then this is a key part of the story, I think, as well. As the USDA began introducing the newest technologies, the most expensive technologies to white farmers, it simultaneously pushed African Americans to raise solely yard flocks, confining them to operations too small to rival those of white farmers. Um, adult black male farmers in the time period that I'm that I'm looking at learned the very same curriculum that white children were learning from their 4-H clubs. And so this reveals the unequal access to information that characterized agriculture in the Jim Crow South and the limits to African American participation in the early phases of the poultry industry. So I want to begin grounding what I'm talking about. So I'm, I'm saying that I'm looking at this revolution that takes place between the 1930s and the 1960s, but it's important for a moment to think about, to go back and think about the post-Civil War South, and hopefully I'm linking to this to where Ricardo was having us think about plantation economies. Um, so again, I'm going back to upcountry Georgia, um, where from Reconstruction onward, so 1865 onward, cotton farmers and furnishing merchants used the crop lien system to finance and market the cotton crop. Merchants and landlords charging high interest rates, advanced credit to farmers in the form of seeds and fertilizers, and at settlement time, farmers paid their creditors. Most of us are, are I think, Maybe I'm sort of telling people things that they already know, but, but we identify this as a really highly exploitative system. During the first decades of the 20th century, um, the cost of cotton production persistently exceeded the market price of cotton, and farmers began, began to assume crushing debt. And by the 1930s, cotton production was becoming increasingly untenable. So the Great Depression and the New Deal are a key turning point in this story um, because it's at this moment when New Deal policies, right? The New Deal, um, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration is paying farmers to take um, cotton land out of production. And it's at this moment that feed man merchants in the South, feed merchants, um, with the aid of national feed manufacturers, become industry leaders by adapting the crop lean system to the production of chicken. So it's these feed manufacturers who are becoming the Tysons and the Purdue's and the Smithfields. In the process, cotton farmers became chicken farmers who from the 1950s onward acquiesced to industry demands, again, going back to this, idea and fact that they're taking on sizable debt 
in much the same way that their forebearers had acquiesced to the demands of cotton furnishing merchants, right? So part of the idea of what I'm looking at in my book is, is thinking about how these customs and traditions are carried on and these exploitative systems are carried on. So just to think about the arc of the story, Ralston Purina and other national feed manufacturers play a crucial role. Um, they viewed the American South as a dumping ground for surplus chicken feed. Um, and so what they began to do was they began to extend credit um, to feed merchants in the American South. Um, and they began distributing feed and credit to local general stores and to Southern merchants like someone like Jesse Dixon Jewell, a native of Gainesville, Georgia, upcountry Georgia, who would eventually establish the region's largest poultry farm, Poultry Land Inc. So he's one of these key people in thinking about the inception of the industry. Um, in the years following World War II, poultry integrators like Jewell developed an ingenious and highly profitable business model that consisted of three components. So the three parts of this business model, and again, I say ingenious, I guess in quotations or italicized, um, the three parts of it are the quasi vertical integration, the feed conversion contract, and then the forced sale of chicken housing and machinery to contract farmers. This business model served as the foundation of the modern poultry industry. And I'm getting kind of to the end of my story again, but by 1967, chicken farmers were providing more than 60% of the capital to run the national poultry industry. And they had no say in production and marketing decisions and earned so little that by the 1960s, most were working off the farm in wage work to make ends meet and to feed their families. So first, so I just want to really briefly dig into these three parts of the business model. The first that I mentioned was quasi vertical integration. Um, poultry integrators do not and did not own the machinery and housing. They did not and do not own the means of production in which their chickens are raised. Um, instead, integrators mandated and mandate that the lowest, that some of the lowest paid workers in the production chain purchase state of the art machinery and housing. Moreover, as we're thinking about kind of the, this, the shape of this indus industry, integrators sell chicken houses and machinery to farmers and finance those loans. From the 1950s onward, integrators increasingly demanded that farmers repeatedly install the newest equipment and construct the newest and largest housing. And so part of what I'm looking at from the between the 1930s and the 1960s is you're seeing um, oral histories where farmers are telling that they've, you know, they've, they've upgraded. Uh, and, and obviously, the integrators are intentionally using that terminology, right? Upgrade, upgrade seems to suggest that you're like getting the newest upgrade of Microsoft Word, when in fact what this means is spending thousands and thousands of dollars on new machinery and new housing. So today, as I'm sure most of you know, poultry farmers invest huge sums of money in chicken houses and machinery. So again, I go back to saying that it's important to label this vertical integration as quasi or semi because the integrators chose not to own the chicken houses very intentionally because this is the most risky and most volatile part of the production chain. The second piece of this business model, so again, I'm trying to look at these three pieces, um, is the feed conversion contract. Um, integrators, um, via this contract, integrators took hold of marketing decisions, permanently taking away any and all marketing decisions out of the hands of farmers. They assumed control of all production decisions and integrators paid farmers based on how efficiently they turned chicken feed into chicken meat, um, a metric entirely unrelated to the market price of chicken. The last piece, which I've already made reference to now a number of time, um, and I guess is, uh, is very much a piece of this story is that chicken farmers, not integrators, own the means of production, the chicken housing and the machinery. In a strange variation of capitalism, 
This meant that by the 1960s, if not earlier, chicken crowers provided more than half of the capital to, want to run what's becoming a billion dollar industry. Um, integrators mandated that farmers repeatedly improve and upgrade their facilities, um, requiring them to build new, um, new buildings, as I've already made reference to, new machinery. Um, one of the farmers who appears in my book upgraded his machinery and houses five times in the course of a 20-year career, sort of remarkable to think about. So from 1950 onward, chicken growers in upcountry Georgia paid for the machinery and housing, the very factories in which they raised chickens. They took on debt to finance this equipment and housing, a practice that became the standard throughout the industry in the South and has later been used in agribusiness both nationally and internationally. While they owned their own land and means of production, farmers had no control over production and marketing decisions and remained indebted to the very people who controlled those decisions. Um, so this brings us back to where I started in 1955. As I told you at the beginning, one agricultural economist explained, the cotton sharecropper has been replaced by the chicken sharecropper. My research illuminates the evolution of agribusiness. It explores the rampant inequalities central to this growth. Um, also a big piece of it are the environmental consequences of um, the poultry industry. So it's here in the upcountry where we can begin to view and understand the origins of American agribusiness, this silent revolution that has really slowly and deeply transformed, transformed American agriculture. So thank you so much. I hope I didn't go over. <laughs> Um, that was all important information and we all needed to hear it. So you're fine. Thank you. <clears throat> Just a reminder, um, with the remainder of our time, uh, this, this uh, conversation will go on until 3.30 after our next special speaker, John Boyd, um, delivers his presentation. Uh, we will open it up for a discussion. The discussion will in include constructive uh, comments more than questions, constructive comments that are ideas that can go help us start to step in the, in the direction of, of um, regenerative reform on, on these within the food production system. Uh, with that, John, you're up. I uh, can't wait to can't wait to hear you. Mute it, John. There you go. Can you hear me okay now? Okay. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, all of my colleagues, uh, Jolene, who delivered that beautiful prayer, and uh, my good friend, uh, Ricardo, who always does an outstanding job. He's a great historian. I was listening to his presentation. And uh, Monica, I used to be one of those uh, chicken sharecroppers for 15 years. Uh, with uh, Purdue Farm. So I certainly can relate to all of those struggles as a uh, poultry farmer. And uh, the first chance that Purdue had the chance to get rid of me as a, as a farmer because I was raising many of the concerns that you were raising in your book, uh, they did that. So that's a, a part of my life that uh, I lived and, and, and certainly understand all of the challenges in, in, the, in the poultry industry. Uh, I'm gonna try to pick up where Ricardo left off. Uh, and that begins uh, with all of the plights and struggles uh, with the United States Department of Agriculture uh, and my experience as a uh, farmer trying to do business. Uh, but then it was called the Farmers Home Administration. And uh, for many of you who don't know, uh, one, of, one of my first uh, tasks as a farmer slash civil rights activist was getting the word uh, Negro off of the federal application. So not a lot of people know about that effort, but that was one of the uh, first uh, uh, really uh, national projects that I worked on was getting the word Negro. So as a young farmer, I still uh, check the word Negro at the, on the applications, uh, then it was called the Farmers Home Administration. Uh, but moving right along, uh, we named the United States Department of Agriculture, the land, last plantation. It was the last federal arm to integrate. It filed lawsuits to prevent uh, black people from working at the United States Department of Agriculture. So myself and other ag 
uh, activists named it the last plantation. And, and today I believe it's rightly so, rightfully so. Uh, it really has lived up and earned that name, the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, I first began to do business uh, by meeting a, a black farmer by the name of Russell Sally in Mecklenburg County, Virginia. He was already trying to do business with Farmers Home Administration and, and they had really already foreclosed on him. And I approached him about buying his farm and uh, he seemed to like me. So I had no dealings with USDA. I didn't know anything about what the uh, long path in front of me was getting ready to be like. I just wanted to farm. Uh, my daddy was a farmer. My grandfather was a farmer, Thomas Board in Mecklenburg County, Virginia. Uh, my mother's parents were, believe it or not, sharecroppers in the 80s. Uh, so I was raised as a, and trained by my grandfather and, and my dad on, on how, to, how to farm. And they taught me about the love of the land. And they taught me if you do right by the land and treat the, treat the land right, uh, the, the land will always take care of you. And I try to live by that motto today as a, a farmer here in, in 2020, which has been very, very hard to do. But uh, trying to participate in USDA uh, was something that I don't think uh, I could ever be prepared for. So if someone told me in high school I was going to be doing some of these things and working on these issues, I would argue them down. I said, no, I don't believe that that's going to be my, my, my story. But I ran into this county supervisor, the person who was in charge of making loans for the United States Department of Agriculture. His name was James Garnett. And I went in to talk to him about buying this farm. And I don't know, I went to school where in the 80s, I wasn't a 60s child and I thought everything was okay. Some, some of my best friends that played sports with me, I played basketball and football and baseball. His name was Jerry Jordan. We were best friends and I thought we were making steps in the right direction on race relations in this country until I met James Garnett. And uh, everything went downhill when I began to apply for farm operating loans and assistance there. And uh, all of the black farmers in Mecklenburg County, he would see us all at the same time, 9 a.m. on Wednesday. And we all come in with our letters and uh, we named it Black Wednesday. And uh, Mr. Garnett would leave the door open and speak downward towards us in a loud and boastful way. And, and uh, many of these gentlemen in the hallway were senior statesmen to me in their 60s and 70s. And I may have been 18, 19 years of age. And I couldn't believe that he was calling these older African Americans boy, uh, people 60 and 70 years of age and telling him how he wasn't going to lend them any of his money. And uh, one particular exchange I had with Mr. Garnett, he tore my application up and, and tossed it in the trash can in front of him. And he said, I'm not going to lend you any of my money. And if I didn't learn how to talk to him, I was, wasn't going to get a loan at any of the local uh, banks because he sat on those boards and he lent more money in Mecklenburg County than all of the banks put together. In fact, he said he was just as, as powerful as, as Jesus Christ is what he told me. And we got into a real heated exchange. And I told him that uh, I don't know what Jesus Christ looks like, but he can't look and act anything like you uh, based on the treatment, the way he was treating uh, black farmers. And uh, he spat on me, spit on me, spat on me, and for the that period of time, I felt less than, less than a man because I wanted to, I wanted to do some real physical alter, altercations there with, with, with Mr. Garnett. And uh, something said, well, if you hit this gentleman, you're, you're going to, to, federal, to the federal pen. And I didn't do it. And I walked back in again and I asked him, was he couldn't make this loan? He said no. And we got into a shouting session. And when I walked outside, I saw all of the USDA employees standing in the parking lot. I said, hmm, what are they doing out there? And I found out years later that they were so shook up by the conversation, everybody left, uh, left the office. But this is the type of discrimination that we faced as, uh, as black farmers. And uh, one particular year, I was sitting in the office, and he would sleep 
during the loan application session. I would wait for him to wake up. And uh, a farmer came in by the name of Earl. And he passed early a government check for $157,000. And I was sitting there in front of him pleading for a $5,000 uh, farm operator loan to, to plant my tobacco crop. And he sat there and he talked about pleasantries and they asked about each other's families as though I was invisible, that I wasn't even there. And the farmer Earl turned around and left the office. And Mr. Garner said, oh, uh, Earl, I need you to come back in here one day next, next week and fill out the paperwork for that loan. So here this guy, he just used his numbers from last year. He picks up a check for $157,000 and I left the office without a farm operating loan. Uh, we moved on and I began to form the National Black Farmers Association with five other uh, Af African-American farmers in, in the area. And we began to protest and we began to file lawsuits. And I filed that same lawsuit in every state from Texas all the way up the Eastern corridor of the United States. And it failed in every federal courthouse. In every state, the judge would make comments and I would write and change, change the complaint and file it in South Carolina, file it in North Carolina, South, file it in Virginia. And when I got to Virginia, my home state, I said, well, if we don't win here, we're gonna to have to go back to uh, the United States Department of, of Agriculture administrative process and try to get some cases settled there. We lost there and Judge Thomas finally said he had never seen so much overwhelming discrimination in one case where the Black Farmers legal team failed to put that into a, a complaint to move forward in federal court. And we filed, lastly, in Washington, D.C. under Judge Paul Friedman. And I walked into the courtroom that day in a pair of brown uh, khakis and a brown flannel shirt and a hat and some boots. I had just left the field and drove three hours to Washington, D.C. And I was prepared to hear what I've heard in all of the other federal courthouses. And Judge uh, Friedman said, well, I wanna hear more of this discrimination that Mr. Board has, has described in this complaint. And Michael Sick called the uh, Department of Justice lawyer, said, uh, Judge Friedman, I, we're not prepared to hear that case today. It failed in this court, it failed in that court. They said this, they said that. And uh, Judge Friedman said, don't ever come in my courtroom and not be prepared to move forward. And I knew then that something special and something different was happening in that case. And uh, the rest is history. We went on to resolve that case in 1999. And uh, 80,000 black farmers came after the filing deadline. I pursued Congress for 10 more years for an act of Congress that uh, then Senator Obama sponsored. Uh, that bill was signed into law when he became president on December 8th, 2010, called the Claims Remedy Act that provided uh, $1.25 billion and a settlement for, for black farmers. Uh, even with all of those things, uh, statute of limitations, there were many, many uh, bumps in the road and a few victories along the way. The United States Department of Agriculture remains a racist institution. Even today, Blacks, Indians, Hispanics, women still cannot receive uh, loans and take part in the U.S. subsidy program under the Trump payout. You know, some $16 billion. Uh, Blacks were virtually absent from that process. Women were virtually absent from that process. Hispanics and Native Americans uh, walked away with basically zero. The Department of Agriculture still finds a way to practice its discriminatory ways, even as we sit here today. Uh, many Black farmers have cases uh, with the Office of Civil Rights where I spent many, many years getting the position in place called the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights. We snuck it in the Farm Bill. And now today, under this administration, the Trump administration, that position lies dormant and vacant. And to me, it's an inactive office that doesn't uh, provide any services or, or justice or, or recourse of actions for, for any of the minority farmer, Black, Hispanic, women, Asian, 
uh, Native American. So we have a lot of work to do. And I'm hopeful that uh, in the coming months, we have a new president and we have uh, a new secretary of agriculture strong enough to make changes to enforce civil rights laws. We have uh, secretaries in the various agencies at the United States Department of Agriculture who will make sure that all farmers take part and receive services and, and all of these things the way that everybody else does. Uh, we have to overhaul the last plantation. Uh, I'm gonna stop right there and maybe take some, hopefully take some questions. John, um, I actually have a quick question for you that will set up the, I think, the next stage as well. And I think it's important um, because you've had some really recent activities, um, I believe, both with uh, Monsanto and John Deere. And, and I would, yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I would ask if you'd spend just a couple minutes, you know, just telling people some of the other things that are going on around here that you're dealing with, too. And then we'll yes. open it up to comments. Thank you. You know, when you start talking about the Department of Agriculture, it's a chapter in itself. But we also are facing a lot of challenges with corporate 500 companies that haven't uh, treated uh, blacks and other minorities well. Uh, we filed suit against Monsanto. And hopefully that uh, many of you can support that lawsuit. Uh, it was filed in St. Louis a few uh, weeks ago. And basically Monsanto was uh, probably one of the worst companies out there. And we would like to see some changes uh, we've been forced to, uh, every farm has been for, forced away from a conventional seed uh, to, a, to a GMO seed. And for many people, if you're living today, you have eaten uh, uh, some of these uh, harsh chemicals because they spray them on wheat and corn and, and, and soybeans. So we hope that you guys could support, support that suit and hopefully we have some justice there and help bring some changes within uh, the, new, the new Bayer Monsanto Company. And lastly, we're working on a current issue uh, where we announced uh, September 9th that we're boycotting uh, John Deere. Uh, John Deere has never displayed a lawnmower at the, at the National Black Farmers Association annual conference. Uh, we reach out to them every year to take part so they can come out and show cutting edge technologies and they refuse to do so. And uh, the service time uh, for black farmers like myself I waited uh, close to a month to have my combine serviced, uh, you know, in the middle of a harvest. You cannot compete like that to be, you can't afford, if anybody knows anything about farming, you can't be down a month and wait for a uh, service. Uh, the type of atmosphere in the local offices for John Deere is not conducive for minority farmers, not just for black farmers, but for minority farmers. They cater to, uh, I'm gonna say it, the large scale white farmers in this country. And if you own a tractor after the year 2010, you can't work on it. You have to wait for these technicians uh, uh, to come out. So we've been trying to meet with uh, President May. Uh, so far, he's declined that uh, invitation. And uh, therefore, our boycott's gonna stand. We're asking people not to buy their tractors and parts and implements uh, until they come to the table and, and, and make it right. Not just for black farmers, but for, for small uh, scale farmers as well. And for all these farmers who can't work on their, they can't work on their equipment. Uh, I'm gonna stop right there. The money for NAACP. Oh, and now uh, I have my wife in the background giving me notes. Uh, also, uh, to to try to curtail our, our boycott, uh, they felt that just giving some money to the NAACP, a million dollars, would would make us go away. But the NAACP isn't buying the tractors. The NAACP isn't making the service calls. The NAACP isn't buying these high price parts uh, that the farmers do. And they want to offer uh, Ayers property. Uh, I, I don't need John Deere to do Ayers property. I need for them to make their company conducive and treat all farmers with dignity and respect and service black farmers and, all, and, treat, and, and treat us all the same. That's what I need John Deere to do. And when we raise the issue, they said, well, we're gonna get around board in the National Black Farmers Association by forming our own black farmers group. And we're gonna have my board member be the head of that group. Uh, what does that say to uh, the black farmers? Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really a slap in the face. Uh, they contributed $5,000 last year to our organization. 
and their new combine costs $1.2 million. Uh, so for the whole national body, 116,000 members in 42 states, they saw a value of $5,000 uh, to the national body. They didn't send any staff to, to come out and talk to the farmers about the, the equipment and the credit program, and they didn't display any equipment. And they, they try to spin it out in the media like they're a great company. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, we're going to stand tall and we're going to bring some uh, systemic change within uh, John Deere. We're going to start with companies like that because they really work hand in hand with the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, there's, they're in and out of agriculture with uh, uh, their former secretary, Mike Johans, is on the board. Uh, when the issue came up, they said, oh, we, we never heard about we had a problem with black farmers. And Mike Johans, who I've had several meetings with uh, at USDA, I had several meetings with on the Black Farmers Bill when he was a U.S. Senator, uh, he knows all about me. Uh, that's what these companies would do. Thank you, John. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, this has been a great presentation. Uh, we appreciate you bringing us from down here to up here on our intellectual thought processes. Thank you. At this time, um, we are now going to open it up for comments. Um, more than questions, we're looking for comments, but if you do have questions, we'll do our best to get this folded into um, the conversation. Uh, we may have to get back on some of the answers on some of that too, but put stuff in the comment bar if we're not able to get around to this. When we ask for comments, just because I'm sure there'll be a, a good handful of people that want to speak, they need to be one minute and under. And if that's not long enough, we have these alternative ways to go about communication. Uh, Laura Thomas, after the call, will continue to um, be looking at comments and questions that may come across. Laura2 at gcresolve.com is the way to continue to be part of this conversation today and onward. Uh, with that, um, if I don't see any names, or actually, I'm going to turn this over to Laura. Laura, do you have anybody up for comments? Yes, please. Um, some of the questions that people had, Rob has already been fast at putting in some links for some of the court cases, but I, I kind of would like to hear. Um, some of our prep rural, rural members put some initial comments. Sherry and Rob, would you want to just kind of, within your first comments that kind of show up, would you have any comments um, in retrospect from this talk? Did you say Sherry? Like yep. Me? Yes. Yep. <laughs> okay. The one thing that uh, struck me was what Ricardo mentioned um, early on is that, and which I think that if you're going to create a dispatch, you should really note and, and push USDA to use a different le lexicon to figure out what those words should be, how we should be referring to various groups and, and, and what's re most respectful. What, you know, what do they want to be called in, in grants or in language that, that the USDA is putting out? We have to create a new narrative and we have to create it, tell a new story. And I think that lexicon, that language is very important. Thank you, Sherry. I think that is really important too. Rob, do you want to just say anything from some of the comments you've been doing in this side before I kick it around? Uh -huh. I would just say that uh, it's an amazing uh, talk. I appreciate all the connections. It's really extraordinary to see that uh, what we have going on today is, is deeply embedded uh, in the history of the country. And I think uh, a lot of the country um, is about uh, denying uh, our history and avoiding the fact that the way agriculture is produced now is deeply embedded into the very lineage that uh, John, Monica, and um, Ricardo uh, lined up from the beginning of the country. Um, so that's all I want to say for now. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And there's just been a few questions. We are recording this call, so um, we'll have it for you so we can all watch it over and over again and keep learning and gleaning from this. Um, I'm going to go, Harriet, are you still on? Would you like to share a few of your comments connecting to Monica's work? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, I guess I can turn my video on too. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, interested in uh, the history of finance and money. And I've been finally putting together the putting out system in the Industrial Revolution, um, the ability to use slaves and slave people as capital, 
for the plantation owners in the U.S. and elsewhere um, to, as uh, collateral to borrow money. Um, the debt structure of continuing of sharecropping to chickens that Monica was talking about and a book I'm reading now which I recommend to everyone by Madeline Fairbairn called Fields of Gold about financial investment in farmland. These are hedge funds and you know the whole elaborate array. And so I, I guess uh, it's leading me more and more these this line of questioning to wonder about debt and finance as the driving mechanism of um, agriculture and uh, indeed the whole economy and whether that is the point of intervention or a point of intervention that might make a lot of sense controlling capital uh, finance finance capital in various ways um, that we talk about Monsanto and we talk about USDA but actually they're enabled by all kinds of rules, um, some of which have to do with finance, some of which have been talked about today. So that's it. Thank you. I'd love if anyone could comment on that. Yeah, I'm, let's, uh, let's allow comments from the three speakers. Uh, three speakers, um, Ricardo, Monica, John, if you wanted to, if you had any input and you wanted to address that, please do sh um, short um, responses, but I think this would be a good one to kick over. Yes, and she's exactly right. That's that's what it gets down to because uh, everybody needs uh, access to credit. Uh, I didn't talk about the access to credit piece, and I didn't talk about the the numbers and statistics of uh, black farmers, uh, less than one percent of the nation's farmers at the turn of the century. We were uh, uh, one million black farmers in this country, owning twenty million acres of land, and. Uh, the 1965 uh, Act for, for the Voting Rights Act gave us the right to vote, but it didn't give us the right to lend us any money. And that's the piece that's missing. So we need access to credit. And the United States Department of Agriculture is uh, to lend, lends more direct money than any lending institution in the United States. Uh, so we need access to credit for, for our farmers to make it and, and to turn the whole situation around. Could I ask if you've thought about credit unions or some kind of cooperative way of banking or creating local currencies or I don't know, the array? The array? Yes, well, we're finally at the table this year with the, the OCC that has a new program out and the controller is gonna be speaking, uh, the uh, controller of the currency will be speaking at our annual convention this year, October 30th and 31st, so we finally, at the table, it looks like we're heading in the right direction and maybe come up with some programs uh, to help small scale farmers. So I'm very, very excited about that. Good. So all the years of trying to get at the table at the OCC, we're finally there. And hopefully I, I will have some, uh, some, some better news in the coming months after, after our conference this year. Um, Monica, Ricardo, did you have any um, comments you'd like to add to Harriet's question? Quickly. So I'll, I'll defer to you, Monica, if you have some comments. I can chip in with something brief. Yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't have, sorry, any, anything to add. Okay, so I'll, I'll just state something that really is <coughs> obvious, but to frame it in a bit of the analysis that I shared uh, with you folks. Um, the, the modern economic answer to how we build wealth is to have access to the three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. And the capital is the product of having land and labor that you combine with entrepreneurship. That's the conventional economic orthodoxy. So capital in itself is a way that you can manufacture more capital and that you leverage to build economic and political power. Uh, that's the way that the system is rigged at, at the moment. If you gain access to capital, you can write the rules that will further enhance your access to, to capital. So it creates this, this positive feedback loop. That's actually what uh, John was referring to and uh, what, what the prior comment was about. So obviously the, the, the control of the financing flow is just this powerful a way of controlling the way that the system benefits and who is going to benefit as if you controlled oxygen to living human beings. So, um, so for all those reasons, I'm just reinforcing that we should not lose sight that all the mechanisms whereby 
financial instruments, whether they be investments, grants, loans, flow to very specific people. And those of you that are familiar with political science know that the definition of policy is to have the authority to decide where the flow of resources are going to go. It's all about that. Okay, who's up next, Laura? Okay, um, I would like, Luis, are you still on? Would you like to um, say anything with the link that you posted, Luis? Are you still <coughs> From the indigenous perspective? Just um, first, let me put my timer on. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Graham and uh, Laura, and to everyone of the uh, speakers here uh, for the willingness and the courage to go to the root cause of, of what um, uh, is um, hurts us as a human family. I, um, it's, you don't find this, uh, you know, conversations um, very often uh, to look at our history as a hum as humanity. Um, uh, it, it seems to be that we don't have the courage. Uh, I really do just wanted to comment uh, on Ricardo's um, uh, presentation about the the dehumanization, uh, you know, of both um, black and, uh, but also um, indigenous. Uh, people. So, I mean, basically, the only uh, reason, uh, you know, that you can take away so much land is by taking away the, the humanity. Um, I just wanted to, 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 to comment on that and to, to find a group of people like this group of people uh, on this call today that is willing to go to that, uh, to that, uh, uh, that deep, uh, I believe, is is a good starting starting point. If with without the understanding of our history, um, we cannot hope for a better uh, humanity. What we're doing is uh, repeating over and over uh, again. And so, I like Ricardo and like um, uh, John and uh, Monica. I sometimes I'm invited and in, in, in do presentations, and I go really. Uh, to these deeps um, um, because um, you know it's 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 just that just uh, we really have to understand um, history in order to 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 build a better human humanity. I do hope that no one um, you know takes uh, you know uh, that this is done in the spirit of. Um, not blaming anybody, not awakening, shaming anybody or guilting anybody, but truly, truly uh, that you just like a, a scientist studies, uh, you know, a virus or a, a germ or with the intention to understand and, and find the cures and, and things for illnesses. I think we as a human family need to look at our history uh, from, from just that, 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 that perspective uh, with the intention to, to build a better human family. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Laura. And, uh, to all the presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. Um, we have a few hands up that I can't see. Rob's letting me know we have a few hands. But we've also have um, Leo Lewis with the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation. Do you have any thoughts to share or comments from today's call? No, I'm just learning. I appreciate you okay. all. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we have Tom Manley's hand up as well. Thanks. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, you're up. Right. I, I just wanted to say thank you and, and just, uh, you know, come, you know, kind of piggyback on some of what Luis was saying too, just the, how critically important it is that we have a, an accurate and thorough reckoning of not just our history, but our present and, and how important that is if we're going to make uh, any good decisions collectively about how we move forward together. And so I just want to, um, offer to to continue these conversations with with John or Ricardo or Monica or anybody on this call uh, about ways that we might be able to um, bring some of this this history to the Moses conference or uh, through uh, organic broadcaster articles or by any way we can just expose it to a wider audience and just make sure that um, that we can we can all collectively uh, come come to a better understanding and reckoning of this history so I'm just putting that out there and happy to continue that conversation if anybody wants to 
talk about bringing some of some of this discussion to the Moses audience. Tom, for those that might not know, um, would you tell just briefly what you know Moses is, and then um, I think maybe throw your email in the message uh, line so that so that some of our friends can connect with you. You bet. Um, we're 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 a, a nonprofit organization, and we. Uh, just create resources for for farmers who are farming organic organically and regeneratively and and working on all of the things that we're working on and we um, we have a we have what is maybe the largest organic farming conference in the country every year in La Crosse, Wisconsin um, and we just we we want that to be as big and inclusive a tent as possible and we want it to be a place where just all farmers feel welcome and uh, and it's important, it's important to us as an organization to create spaces to have these kinds of conversations. So um, we're, we're happy to, to talk about how we can do that and do it well. Um, so, and I'm we'll offer, And we'll offer um, help in connect some of the experts, you know, that can help deliver uh, this message, you know, with you after Tom. So we'll be in touch. Excellent. Thank you. Graham, we have um, Scott Marlowe's hand up. Scott, are you still online? Um, I am here. Um, thank you. And thanks very much to all three of the panelists. And, um, and I, I wanted to connect a couple of dots. In John's statement, one of the things that he said, and I wanted to, to highlight it was he said that the loan officer said, I'm not lending you any of my money. Um, and, that, and, and that's a cultural thing within USDA, which is how, and I, was, I sat in on a, a, a meeting of county directors after a disaster where the main topic of conversation was how can we keep those people from taking our money? Oh. But as we talk about those attitudes that are rife within the agency, we also have to talk about the, the larger and structural. When we talk about the access to credit, we have to move back into looking at access to risk management and how we quantify and think about risk because that's really the origins of the issues of access yeah. to credit. It's a fascinating thing to me that a person can tomorrow get a um, $1.5 million loan to put in a poultry house, but can't take out a loan for $200,000 or even $50,000 to put in a mixed crop and livestock direct market. And that is all specifically about how we, how we quantify and address risk. It has to do with our disaster programs. It has to do with crop insurance. And so while the issues of race may not be included in them at all, what they do is they magnify, um, uh, credit is the mechanism by which risk management programs become proactive rather than reactive. And so when we have it built around issues, when we have that risk management built around historical industrialization, it therefore magnifies and reinforces the structures that have been built around the, the, the racial structures and the racial, racial exclusion that is so endemic and core to industrialization. And so as we, as we move upstream, I just wanted to make the point that while we can talk a lot about the attitudes of individuals at the county level and, 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 and nefarious people at the county level can turn any program into a predatory program. It doesn't matter what it is, can turn any program, but we have to look upstream at these how, at core questions of how we quantify, measure, and then address risk. Thank you, Scott. And that, um, I sat in on a, a Zoom, we have a, uh, the Union for Contemporary, Contemporary Art here in Omaha has a redlining exhibit and it was really around that risk. So thank you for bringing that into the origin of this conversation that we have to really look at what we define as risk. And um, thank you. We keep the comments coming. We'll address them after. I wanna go to Brian Williams. Um, he is talking about the market facilitation program payments. The night Brian, do you wanna, are you still there? I just wanted to share that link because um, Lowry Parker had mentioned she wonders how much of the current subsidies this year will go to black farmers. And I mean, under the Trump administration, clearly um, very, very, very little. Um, I mean, it's obviously um, uh, uh, there's there's such a deep history of, you know, farming programs being used to redistribute wealth in a perverse way to white land monopoly interests. And it just seems to be doubled down on in the Trump administration. And I, I certainly hope that a broad-based people's movement can um, lead to 
land redistribution reparations and the end of these perverse incentives for white monopoly agrarian capitalism. Thank you, Brian. Graham, do you want our, our speakers to say, to chime in with any final thoughts or what would you, how do you like me to keep going with this? Oh, you're muted. Is there anybody else that wants to have one last live comment here? And then I would definitely like to have a, a closing you know, statement from each one of our excellent speakers. Yes, and please, if you put some comments in that you would like, um, please, please speak up now. This is Megan. I have just a, a farm nerd question for John. Um, you are such an incredible human being. Thank you for blessing okay. our earth. Um, but so we're boycotting uh, John Deere. Who are we buying? Who would you like us? You know, um, who do you buy? Who's your manufacturer? Well, basically, basically the the companies that are left are uh, uh, Mahindra. Uh, there's Case International. Uh, that both have Case International and uh, New Holland. Uh, those are some of the other products that are out there. John Deere has uh, about a 50% take of the uh, total business, uh, 60 to 70% take of the resale value for people who own John Deere. Uh, so there's some other companies out there. Uh, uh, we encourage those to, to look at those other companies. Uh, not saying that they're perfect, but uh, there's certainly a, an alternative why uh, John Deere is the top of the line and really, and, and really, really dumping on minority farmers. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, John. Um, Abby Adent, can you, she, please? Oh, Abby. yeah. Hello. Abby, um, sorry. <laughs> no, no, Bill Dunn is fine. But, um, or Abby. But yeah, I just wanted us to, as you know, a lot of people have said the same things, you know, the brother talk about um, uh, indigenous folks and all the things. I, I think, you know, as we move forward, we, it's time to continue to study um, the culture of whiteness and how it's affected the world. Why is there a need for control? Why is there a need for um, colonization everywhere, you know, um, whiteness goes? Why is there a need for all of that? Because, um, as we continue to do research on, for instance, I had a Georgia State student wanted to do a project on Gangsters of Growers, my program, and you know, the farmer, Whitney CJ, who's one of the educators for our program, she was there working the market with me. It's a fresh food market at train stations in Atlanta. Um, she was like, no, we need to study whiteness. <laughs> we know why people are poor. We know why, we know all those reasons. It's time to study whiteness because now it's affecting um, different cultures all over the world and everyone um, black white whatever you look like is being um, infected with this culture of whiteness where you have to have things you know in order uh, in other people's things and just the accumulation of things um, also this idea of this I know this is how businesses operate with credit and loans and all those things I mean I, I feel like it's almost operating from a scarcity model you know what I mean? Like, we it's it's time for um, you know some people think the word is scary, but reparations or it's just time for people to just give folks the money, give people the money. You know, we just participated um, with the National Black Food Justice Alliance that we're a part of with the reparations summer campaign, where they cultivated ten uh, white folks and up being nine. It went from thirty something to nine that agreed to give ten percent of their wealth and also organize around other, um, their white friends or whatever to um, give money, right? And we were able to get $55,000, you know, 20% went, not 20, 20,000 went to our partner farm so we can grow hemp and bamboo so we can cr start creating our worker owned co-ops with the youth that we work with, formerly incarcerated youth, um, doing hemp and bamboo. Um, hemp and bamboo and uh, to create products of, and 35,000 is going to our program that we're about to run for six months. But we really only have $23,000 in the bank to run a full six month program with formerly incarcerated youth where we're doing yoga, group therapy, political education, financial literacy, working on farms, making a hot sauce, all these things that we eventually wanna become self-sufficient as we were during um, reconstruction era, you know, and throughout other times for specifically when it comes to black people. You know, we want to be self-sufficient. We don't want no, you know, ask people for money. We don't want loans. We don't want loans. 
we just need y'all to give up, not y'all, you know what I'm saying? But uh, we need the system to just give us what we deserve and so that we can become self-sufficient because that's what we want. We don't want to be on anyone's teeth. Um, and literally the time is now and we need white, our white counterparts to go ahead and continue to spread that exact mes message. I don't care nothing about credit. I know that's how it works, but we need to start spreading the message of just give give folks the money. Y'all got it. Um, so y'all look up Reparation Summer Campaign. Um, there's other organizations that have young white youth that come from wealth. Um, and I can't think of the two organizations, but they take their money and give it to black organizations, um, indigenous organizations and things like that. But that's what the time is calling for now. Um, and some of us just don't want to participate in that part of the system either. Um, but anyway, I appreciate this convening. Thank you so much, Abby. Graham, Lou. Yeah, um, I just want to thank everybody for being in the space today. Uh, starting off with our three amazing speakers, I'd uh, like, to, like to thank um, the, the core of PrEP uh, that we've been working with, um, Rob and John and Etant primarily, um, who, uh, who reached out to, to organize these important conversations. For the core group, you know, that, that um, allowed this to be an open meeting so we can expand and have more, more people at the table for this important discussion. And, and for Jolene's blessing that, that put this conversation in the right direction. Um, we look forward to diving into this. Uh, we, will be, we will be sharing um, different stages of the work along the way. And, you know, this is an, this is an open door group now. Um, we're working on this together. So I'm not going to know how to perfect the, the language of the next document that comes out. So I'm going to be leaning on people. And that's an invitation to be, um, to be, a, to be a larger part and a co-signatory of this, this next piece that we put out. And I, you know, the more the merrier. We'll do our, we'll do our best to take um, everybody's strategic input uh, on this. Um, there was a fundraiser coming up for Prep Rural. Uh, this is a crowdfunded effort. And so, um, you know, anything is grateful to keep these kind of conversations going. Um, we've had a lot of traction in the early stages. I imagine this conversation is going to continue to, to get a little bit of attention. Uh, let's see here. The fundraiser is October 14th, and it's actually a party, um, also a release party for Rob Wallace's of Prep <coughs> new book um, around COVID-19. You can register uh, for this special event at prepthepeople.net. And I don't know, I think with that, um, once again, a final thank you and look forward to engaging in upcoming days, months, and hopefully years. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna come visit you, Mr. Boy. We're gonna thank find you. a way to get the youth to visit you. We'd love to have you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. I think uh, thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy your uh, rest of your week, and we're going to end the program here. Um, and this will be available um, online at some point. So uh, we'll give everyone a heads up where, where it's available. Thank you. <laughs>